Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast series on leadership perspectives from the field. And today, I'd like to introduce Pete Cuso. We've known each other for over 25 years, actually. I'm someone I admire and respect greatly, and I'm very interested to hear his stories about leadership. Uh, before we get into the meat of our discussions today, I'd like to pass over to Pete just to say a few words to introduce himself in terms of who he is and his background. Pete, welcome. Thank you, Tony, and thanks for those kind words of introduction. 25 years, wow. Mm. We must both have been about 10, 12 years old when we first met, I guess. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get these gray hairs for nothing. But hi, everyone. I'm looking forward to our discussion. I know it's a bit of a, a one way between me and Tony, but I'm hopeful that you can gain some nuggets from my 40 years doing this kind of work in the global corporation experience. I've uh, worked in those 40 years for companies such as GE, uh, not GEC in the UK, but General Electric. I've worked in uh, HP in Stanley Tools, which many of you may be familiar with, with Syngenta, a biosciences company based out of Basel, Switzerland, and several others actually over the course of those four decades. And I'm just really looking forward to sharing some of my experiences, some of my aha moments. And again, hopefully if you can glean one or two nuggets out of this conversation, I think our time would be well spent. Pete, thanks very much for that. The first question is really about an experience you personally have had as a leader, uh, something that was a major milestone or a breakthrough in your development as a leader, could be early in your career, could have been later, but something that has stuck with you when you think about uh, what you've achieved as a leader over these uh, significant number of years. So, Pete, could you share with us a story about that leadership experience? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Tony. In fact, if it's okay with you, I probably would share a couple of stories mm -hmm. because uh, any one of them in a vacuum, I think, is, is not uh, adequate. But I think what I'd love to do first, before I get into my story, is give you a little bit of context of how I view leadership, how I view uh, work in the uh, global context, and it's just a couple of kind of um, foundational or stakes in the ground I have personally. The, the first one is quite simple, that organizations are comprised of human beings, not human doings. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Well, as you'll see throughout our discussion today, my bias is focusing on the human side of organizations, be it individuals, teams, smaller parts, sub-organizations, or the entire entity. So that has always been important to me, and we'll talk through what that means and how I've kind of turned that adage into action. Also, I believe very deep down that one of the most important things we as leaders can do is to engage our employees. And engagement is sometimes an overused term, mm. but I think of engagement across three domains, head, heart, and hands. So in other words, we need to engage people at an intellectual kind of brain level, <laughs> We need to engage people at a heart, at an emotional kind of level, and then a hands level, kind of like Tony, we used to do at GE with the action workouts, where it's one thing to talk about what we're going to do differently, say, on, on an assembly line, but to actually get out there and do it um, is, is that much more important. A couple of others real quick. One is... I think the process of new employee organization, others will call a uh, new employee orientation, others will call it onboarding or those kinds of things, I think are critical for new employees to actually connect those individuals to the organization, align those people to where the organization is going. I think that is fundamental in a person's first few weeks, if not months in an organization. And the last thing I'd say leading up to my stories are, at least in my experience, leaders don't lead in a vacuum. And I have found myself, and you'll see this in my stories, that I've always partnered. I haven't been a lone ranger going out into the wilderness and, and doing something 
transformational. For me, it's always been through a collaborative partnership kind of approach. Mm -hmm. So with that as background, maybe there's a couple of uh, stories I could tell. One is from my early career work at General Electric when uh, in the mid 80s, 1985 or so, so I was just out of university a couple of years, I was assigned to a organization called GE Sourcing. Basically, it was the corporate purchasing organization of GE. And mm -hmm. back in those days, it was GE's heyday where we bought over a billion, one billion US dollars of uh, direct and indirect materials from around the world. And I had the, uh, the pleasure and the honor of working with a contracting agent, a purchasing agent whose name is Bob Horn. I didn't know anything about purchasing when I went into that hmm. role, but I did know about information technology. And I worked with Bob to understand what does a contracting agent do? And this, if you think about it, you know, GE was spread around the world. We might have a consolidated purchasing uh, program around, I'm going to pick a commodity, ball bearings for all weird purposes, right? I mean, you think about it, steel bearings, integrated circuits at the time, all those kind of things we bought in the hundreds of millions of dollars um, each year. So working with Bob, I understood what I got to understand what a contracting agent from a consolidation standpoint needs to do. And I wrote systems around how we could analyze bids. And that system was in place for probably eight to 10 years. We had savings of well over $300 million of um, real cost savings to the company. And Bob and I were jointly awarded the, the largest management award ever given in that department um, in, its, in its history. Again, I'm dating myself back to 1985 but mm. that's a leadership perspective where I brought the technology and software perspective. Bob brought the, I'll call it the technical perspective. And we kind of married the two together. Um, if I can give you another example, and you tell me if I'm going over time or not. Mm -hmm. But fine. at uh, Syngenta, which is a biosciences company, biotechnology company, where again, you and I work together in Basel, Switzerland, was its base. Uh, for those that don't know, Syngenta was a joint venture or a merger, I should say, of AstraZeneca and Novartis's bioscience businesses. And they were competitors the day before, the day after the signing, all of a sudden it was a joint effort. And what we did at Syngenta is perhaps the greatest organizational leadership uh, process I ever went through and what we were doing basically is reinventing the company. What is our purpose? As Jim Collins would refer to purpose. You know, why are we in existence as an organization? What's, what's, what are we giving to the world? We talked about our vision, our ambition, our values, our leadership uh, processes, our story, all of those kinds of things, which may sound like it's very... Uh, ambiguous and kind of group hugs every morning, but it was actually very much of a structured process. We, we used an outside firm called the Nowhere Group. And over the course of nine months, we went through, and I personally traveled around the world collecting data from employees. The size of the company was about 20,000 employees at the time. I personally spoke with or presented to over 1,000 of our employees, so roughly 5% at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and was able to help that process running what they can call the catalyst team. And mm -hmm. as a typical catalyst in a chemical reaction, our role was to help facilitate the processes and then dissolve and, and get out of the way. So, so that's what and we I think, did. Uh, sorry if I can interrupt, but I think in that example, there was always the uh, challenge of dealing with uh, skepticism or resistance to change. There would be some that would be clearly advocates and pioneers to support the change process, but there, are, there were others that were perhaps wanting to hang on to the, the old ways of working rather than the, the new purpose that the company was trying to establish. Yeah, you're exactly right. And our key was, first of all, our CEO, Michael Pragnell, was very much behind it. 
what you need. If you don't have senior leadership behind the initiative, it's most likely going to fail. Mm -hmm. The second thing we did was we erred on the side of inclusivity versus exclusivity. And mm -hmm. so we brought a team together from around the world every quarter. The team consisted of about 25 or 30 business leaders from across the world. Again, this is not an inexpensive undertaking, True. but it was a process of getting buy-in, of getting engagement, of getting people's inputs so they could see themselves in the final product. That was a, a really critical piece. Mm -hmm. And then we, we focused on people's strengths. And um, you know, I brought people onto my Catalyst team, for example, who were uh, org development, leadership development experts who could facilitate large multicultural groups, those kinds of things. And again, we were able to uh, make the process happen. It was, um, it was quite remarkable, actually. It, it totally transformed the way the company did business. And what about you personally? What effect did it have on you personally later on in your career? Well, the, the, one of the big ones was having that focus on collaboration. Again, back to how I started that no one of us, whether it was the Catalyst team, the Purpose team, anybody else dealing with this project, it was not going to happen alone. And mm. it, it, it needed to take its time. You know, one thing I learned early on in my days at GE from Steve Kerr, who was our chief learning officer at the time, he said, Pete, the greatest change, the best change, if it feels imposed, is going to be rejected or at least resisted. Yeah. And so one of the things we had to do was kind of a go slow to go fast strategy, which, you know, it's unfortunate from a time and cost perspective. But, you know, as most change leadership models show, the more time you could tape up, take up front to get that buy in uh, to get people's head, heart, and hands engaged in the project, the better chances you have not only of succeeding, but sustaining it over time. Is there an example that you can think of where you have observed in someone else strong leadership? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've been very fortunate, Tony, uh, as you know, to work directly with GE's former CEO and chairman, Jack Welch, Time mm. Magazine's CEO of the century back last century. Mm. And um, Jack was, was CEO from, don't these might not be the exact dates, from roughly 1981 to 2001. Mm. And I was at GE from 1982 to 1999. So my 17 years were encapsulated within his tenure as CEO. And the last nine months of my career at GE, I got to work with Jack directly and learned a ton, way beyond the books he wrote, way beyond the public persona of this gentleman named John Francis Welch Jr. And um, I, I think where I'd like to start, there, there were two or three kind of instances that have um, stayed with me based on what Jack said. One of the things, and you have to remember back in those days, GE was a 400,000 employee company. You know, its market cap was somewhere around $800 billion. It was huge. Number one in the world at that time, no longer even close. But Jack used to use a term, lunatic fringe. He would say, I need to be on the lunatic fringe of pushing our people. And one example of that is in 1995, we launched uh, Six Sigma Quality. Yeah, and, remember and, that. Yeah, and it was September of 95, and um, Jack would say, we were about a Three Sigma company at the time from a quality perspective. And by the way, the, the whole notion of focusing on quality came out of our previous employee engagement surveys that we had mm -hmm. conducted and I was part of not leading, but I was part of the, the team that helped put those together and analyze the results. Our own people said our quality at GE is not very good. Mm -hmm. So we decided to undertake a Six Sigma approach. And Jack was out there saying things like, we will be a Six Sigma company in less than five years. Mm -hmm. Now, in a private moment, 
he would turn to me and say, Pete, there's no way we are going to be Six Sigma in five years. It's impossible. But then he'd kind of reflect and say, well, what do you want me to say? We're going to be a Six Sigma company in 20 years? No, you know, he had, that's the, what he main, meant by a, one example of the lunatic fringe. Uh, mm -hmm. He needed to really push the envelope and stretch, you know, our goal so that even if we didn't meet that stretch goal, we would get much closer to it than we would otherwise. Another thing that stuck with me of, of Jack's um, management leadership style was he said, whenever a new leader comes into an organization, he or she has 30 days to make the changes they need to make, both what he called hardware and software changes. The hardware changes are organizational structure, you know, maybe divesting part of the organization, building a, a, a new part of it. And then the software was the people side. And Jack got a, a, a tough rap for his bad, you know, a, a, a bad reputation, if you will, being called Neutron Jack because he didn't care about the people. The mm -hmm. exact opposite was true. He cared so much about the people that he wanted those who could succeed in a GE environment to be empowered to go. And those that could not succeed, it was kind of our gift to them to let them go. That was mm -hmm. the perspective on it. And so this 30 day notion, because otherwise Jack would say, you, the new leader are gonna be part of them, right? Mm -hmm. So while you still have some objectivity, think about the 30 days. And there were, were a couple of other things that really struck me ab about him. Um, you know, at, at that point in time, I was in charge of our executive education at uh, what was called GE Crotonville, the Leadership mm -hmm. Institute, which is now, believe it or not, up for sale in the oh. U.S., in uh, Ossining, New York. And I was going in trying to justify to Jack ROI on our education programs. And he kind of stopped me mid-sentence and he said, Pete, you either believe in this stuff or you don't. And what he meant by this stuff was, if we're gonna have what we used to refer to as the common coffee pot, where you bring executives, leaders, managers together of all different levels to be able to actually talk about their businesses, learn together. He was very focused on learning and development, but he said, there's no need to put numbers to it. You know, and that's an odd thing coming from Jack Welch, who was so operation focused. But I was I was thankful because my conversations with Jack, whenever I would go to his office and I'd talk to Roseanne, his executive assistant, I would invoke Professor Welch. I didn't want to talk to CEO Welch. I was looking for Professor Welch. And it was a different mindset that he and I were able to talk about things about the future. How could we leverage learning uh, in the uh, corporation? for the good of the corporation as well as the good of the individual. In fact, one of his quotes, and I might not get this quote exactly, but he said, organizational learning and the ability to implement learning quickly, in other words, take action on that learning quickly, is perhaps the last sustainable competitive advantage an organization has. There have been different uh, takes on that quote. Some said ultimate competitive advantage, but the whole point was, learning and development and growth were such a key part of who he was and what he wanted the organization to be. Again, both at an organizational level and an individual level. And two other quick points I'd make, okay, maybe three. Um, at the end of one of my programs, and Jack would come in to, to, uh, to speak to the groups at various times, I asked him, I said, Jack, if you could incorporate into one sentence what a leader is, what would that be? And he said the following, he said, a leader has a vision, owns the vision, communicates the vision and drives it to completion. So in other words, the leader has a vision. You, you've got to think about the future. You have to own the vision and believe in it. It can't be something that's just frivolous. Yep. Communicating the vision and not just communicating it with words, but with the passion and the energy behind it. And then execution, you know, driving it to completion. That, that was his encapsulation in one sentence of what a leader is. And so at GE, we, because we had 400,000 plus people, we had to keep things simple. And I don't mean simplistic, but I mean simple. We had to keep our messages simple. Mm -hmm. And so one of the models, if you will, frameworks we used for leadership were the four E's, that a leader needs to have energy, 
-hmm. the ability to energize others, energize and motivate, the ability to have what we called edge, the ability to make difficult decisions, and then that other E word we just talked about, execution. Mm -hmm. So energy, energize, edge, and execution. And when I talk about this idea of simplicity, you know, we've heard the old adage before that um, a friend of mine once wrote me a four-page letter, and he said, Pete, if I had more time, it would have been a one-page letter. <laughs> the point being that to be complex is simple. Mm -hmm. Four-page letter is simple, but to be simple is complex. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'd, I'd leave you with was a, a saying that we had uh, and GE, a couple of different ones. One was being open to ideas from anywhere. And I think that's a critical piece of leadership. And Jack had that, even though he had firm beliefs in what he knew about the organization, where he thought it should go, he welcomed the pushback. It's just people were afraid to give him the pushback. And so he would jump all over them. So, you know, that was his style. But we also had, and this will be my final point on this, uh, a saying that we said um, to be effective as an organization, we need to have speed, simplicity, and self-confidence. So self-confident employees leading to simple solutions, not simplistic, but simple solutions that we can then generate speed, we can do quickly. Yeah. So yeah. that's those are kind of some of my memories of, of Jack. Um, you know, is, again, absolute honor to have worked for him and with him, especially mm -hmm. in the heyday of, of the company during his last couple of years as CEO. Now, there's some great stories there. Thank you for sharing those. I think one of the things that I was struck by is that um, through his leadership, the ability to mobilize people and to, uh, you taking, for example, the Six Sigma example, how fast that led through the organization. It was amazing to see how that just uh, multiplied. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great example. Another one that happened annually was every January, as you know, we used to bring the top 400 leaders together in Boca Raton, Florida, for the Boca meeting, right, which was talking about mm -hmm. the initiatives for the following, you know, for that current beginning of that current fiscal year. And mm -hmm. back in those days, we didn't have internet, we didn't have email like we do nowadays. Mm -hmm. So we would videotape some of the key presenters, put them on either a VHS or a beta tape, boy, am I dating myself. And we'd <laughs> ship these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these all around the world so everybody could see what happened. So within, I'd say, a week to 10 days of the Boca meeting, everybody had access to be able to communicate what the Boca meeting was all about, what were the key right. outcomes from the meeting. Again, mm -hmm. unheard of when you have a 400,000 plus employee base. My question is around what are the requirements of leaders going forward? What do you, from your perspective, where do you think leaders need to focus uh, to be effective in the environment they're now faced with? So do we have a couple of hours for this? No, no. <laughs> no. I'll try to encapsulate it in five minutes. Uh, at least, again, this is totally my perspective, my bias, yep, everything absolutely. associated with, with, mm -hmm. with that kind of thing. Um, you, you know, it's funny, if you go to Google and you just Google the word leadership, you get something like 5.5 billion hits. Mm -hmm. If you Google definitions of leadership, it goes way down to 270 million definitions. And if you go to Amazon books and mm -hmm. put in leadership books, depending on what day you do it, you get either 50,000 or 60,000 books in print on leadership. So all with, all with the answer, <laughs> all with the answer, right? This is the way to do it. So I'm going to give you 60,001. This will be in my book. Maybe you and I can co-author it. So my bias on this stuff, Tony, is I'm going to call it human centered leadership. Uh -huh. And it's consistent with the way I've thought about leadership these past 40 years. Um, it's about prioritizing a leader prioritizing his or her people and their organizational culture. Mm -hmm. And with the understanding that results 
are an outcome of that. It's not that the results are first. The results are an outcome. Mm -hmm. And most of the leadership models that I've put together for organizations in my career have really three domains to it. There's the strategy, the people, and the results domains, if I can call them that. Strategy, there has to be setting direction, you know, focus on uh, alignment of the future. There's mm -hmm. the people side, which is communication, making sure you have the right people in the right seats on the bus, as mm -hmm. Jim Collins would talk about. And then it's all about results, the performance, you know, the, uh, the financials, the non-financials. So when I talk about human-centered leadership, and I'm not sure if there is a initial author of that or the concept, but to me, there is probably 10 or 12 elements of human-centered leadership, I think, your audience would, would appreciate. One is that the leader needs to be authentic and genuine. And in fact, a good friend of mine and a colleague of mine, Sharon Lamb Hartman, just wrote a book earlier this year called The Authenticity Code, where she gets into what does authenticity actually mean from both a leadership and a personal perspective. I think the person, the leader has to have a growth mindset, both mm -hmm. for the business and for his or her people. So in other words, this whole idea of, of development, mm -hmm. I don't think they will be successful micromanaging these days. They need to remove barriers. But again, my experience at, at GE was, and I was so grateful for it, the management team just let me do my thing. And, and in projects and areas that I initially had no clue how to do, one of my projects, I worked with the governor of West Virginia at the time, Gaston Caperton, on a strategy for the West Virginia University system. I had no idea what I was doing going in. I was shaking, that's what I was doing. And again, working with an outside consultant, working with the governor, his chief of staff, and the university presidents, we were able to get that accomplished. But there were a couple of butterflies, more than a couple of butterflies at the beginning of that. Um, I think a leader of the future and currently needs to acknowledge their own blind spots a leader cannot know everything. And this is where they have to surround themselves with people. My, my um, strategy all along is to find people who are better than me, which mm -hmm. was not hard to do. And mm -hmm. people like yourself, for example, that I could rely on who were subject matter experts and that I had trust in. And that's another key word, trust mm -hmm. and trustworthiness. Yeah. Um, I talked about this a couple of times in our discussion around engagement. How do you actively engage others, their head, heart, and hands? How do you enable individuals and teams to create, to innovate, to move ahead? I talked about one of those GE values before about being open to ideas from anywhere. You know, if back in my earliest days, I was a COBOL programmer, COBOL 68, if I need to date myself. And at that point in my life, every solution, every software solution was through the lens of COBOL 68. Mm -hmm. that's not the way to run a railroad, right? You need to be yeah. open to ideas yeah. from anywhere and have that respect for others. You know, assuming you have the trust, be accountable for one's own actions. I think accountability is huge. Mm -hmm. Understanding bias, especially unconscious bias. We hear more and more about that these days and mm -hmm. understanding your own bias uh, to other people, whether it's a, it's a visual bias, a cultural bias, those kinds of things. What you mentioned before, I think, is important also around technology. I think leaders of today need to leverage and embrace technology. I am not a good person when it comes to technology. I'm not very effective. In fact, I kind of make a joke about it. There's high tech, there's low tech, and then there's no tech. I fall into the no tech category as a leader, but I do surround myself with people who know what they're talking about. But likewise, I think the leader needs to recognize excellent work recognize mm -hmm. and reward. It's not just say, great job. You mm -hmm. know, as you know, back in the GE days, when we used to get a letter from Jack, a handwritten letter on a job well done, I mean, these were frameable moments. Yeah. Um, yeah. They could have given you a thousand, ten thousand dollars and it would not have been as effective as mm -hmm. that letter. And just a couple more. Um, I think that a leader of the future has to have the courage to make the right choices. It's not a popularity contest or a people pleasing contest or a let's have group hugs every morning. Human centered leadership is not about singing Kumbaya, right? Mm. It's about a focus on the individual, 
their work output, their development, their career progression, and understanding of how the organization and the individual coexist. So that's how I, think, I would kind of wrap that up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, that one about making the right choices, uh, I would add to that, accepting that there's a, a vulnerability because sometimes the choices turn out not to be right and decisions that's weren't right. the right ones. But accepting that there's a vulnerability and that we can all make mistakes. That's right. And taking accountability for mm -hmm. those mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, you may have made a good decision based on the data you had. You're never going to have all the data you need to make an appropriate decision and mm -hmm. being able to just say, I messed up. I think yeah. that's a huge characteristic of an effective leader. Yeah. Pete, thank you.